dear colleagues of our international research conference, the periodical and the changing society. Uh, we have a two days conference, and I would like to invite uh, the director of partnership and to Vilnius University, uh, Dr. Arturas Vasilaskas, for for uh, greeting. Uh, for greeting. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, okay. Dear all, good morning and welcome to the online international research conference, the Periodicals on the Changing Society, hosted by the Vilnius University Faculty of Communication. Just a few words about Vilnius University. Since I am addressing an international audience, I would like to emphasize that as the largest university nationally with around 23,000 students, as a comprehensive university, covering, covering uh, practically all areas knowledge of knowledge of our 15 academic departments. As the university delivering international excellence research in many fields, we strongly, strongly believe that internationalism, that is the aspiration to work across and above local agendas, connecting with diverse experiences and approaches, establishing wide range cooperation benefits us all. Right from its foundation in 1579, Vilnius University was a part of European academic network. Many of our students, professors, and even, even rectors mm -hmm. came from all parts of Europe. We are committed to the 18th century historical slogan written on the wall of our old observatory, Hink Itur Ad Astra, from here the way leads to the stars. And our current objectives are briefly expressed in our vision statement, and I quote, we are a university of a living tradition committed to truth and society. We work together to be a center of scientific knowledge and critical thinking recognized in, in the world and the, and the force of change in Lithuania. I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to our partners for the, their highly appreciated contribution. We are pleased to collaborate with Crossrail, a leading nonprofit open digital infrastructure organization for the global scholarly research community. Additionally, our uh, thanks go to the Lithuanian Association of Scientific Periodicals. Their initiative and partnering with Crossref not only enriches this conference, but also expands its international dimension. This year has seen various milestones, yet the 200th anniversary of the Lithuanian Periodical Press holds special significance for us, and also we meaningfully mark it by this conference. It is essential to recognize and understand the pivotal role periodicals have played throughout history and their continuing relevance today. The conference agenda encompasses both historical and current perspectives on periodical publishing, with a special focus on scientific uh, periodicals. With the distinguished speakers from six different countries, representing universities and other organizations joining us, we can look forward to a broad spectrum of insights and discussions. Let's embark on this collaborative exploration. Thank you for your participation, and I invite you to have a productive and intellectually nurturing two days. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Director. Thank you. I would, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dean uh, at the Faculty of Communication, uh, Professor Vladimir Mikhevich, also for welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, Deputy Rector already said a very um, good words, encouraging words, uh, starting the conference. Um, so I would like to share my insights about the, the value of this conference. So the esteemed colleagues, a warm welcome to each and every uh, one uh, of you at the conference, uh, the periodicals and the changing society uh, that is commemorating the 200th anniversary of Lithuanian periodical press. It's a really a distinct uh, honor to us to, uh, to host this significant event uh, at the faculty of, uh, of communication at Vilnius University. Uh, the landscape of, uh, of media and publishing is undergoing rapid transformations. Um, and uh, it's really important to have the active participation in this process of scholars and practitioners. As we are navigating these changes, it becomes imperative for us to come together and share our knowledge, expertise, uh, um, uh, experience uh, uh, of best practices, and of course, offer insights into emerging trends. Our collective goal uh, should not only be to adapt to these changes, but also to seek innovative solutions 
uh, thereby creating added value for our organizations and fostering positive societal transformations. And of course, the rich um, uh, various of topics um, uh, that would cover this uh, this conference uh, show the multi and interdisciplinary research area of the publishing. And, and I think that uh, in this conference, we will see the three main trends uh, in the research. The first, of course, is historical development of print and publishing. Um, um, because, you know, through the lens of, uh, through the historical lens, uh, we aim to analyze the evolution of print and publishing, exploring contextual shifts uh, that have shaped our field. Of course, um, in this conference, there would be analysis of interrelationship of publishing press and media uh, in relation with statehood. Uh, of course, there would be some insights on contemporary changes in periodicals, in publishing and in media. So the conference programme is a testament to the depth of our shared interest. And it builds bridges between historical perspectives and the current landscapes uh, facilitating discussions on best practices and providing a roadmap for future developments. So I truly honored to welcome you all at this conference. And uh, I would like to wish that the presentations would be engaging, that discussions would be insightful. And of course, I wish uh, a rewarding and intellectual stimulating experience for everyone. So welcome and good luck to all of you. Thank you, Professor Nathan Kachinev for the, the uh, greeting speech uh, and uh, 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 have a good conference. And I want to say some words about the conference and about technical information for, for our moderators, uh, guests and speakers. Uh, this year, Lithuania celebrated two, 200 uh, of the Lithuanian periodical press in Lithuanian language, but the history of the, our country uh, periodical press is much older. We will see it uh, Thursday. I would like to thank uh, our partners, the Association of Lithuanian, Serial, Lithuanian Scientific Serials, our partner, and the international digital publishing uh, company Crossref. You know about, I think you know all about this company. Uh, uh, it, it was our partners, and uh, we are grateful for that. Uh, have the opportunity to help us for this conference. Uh, brief technical information uh, in this day, uh, speakers, moderators and guests will be able to participate, participate in a follow section in this day. We'll have a follow section. section. All loggings uh, have been sent by email for, uh, for speakers and moderators. Guests can connect uh, uh, we have the link posted in the conference website. Uh, the thing, uh, authors of the scientific reports will be given the opportunity to publish scientific articles uh, prepared on the basic of reports in the International Scientific Journal in Water or in Pain and Book Science. Um, the journal secretary will be will contact the speakers uh, after the conference. We have a mail. Just a mail this after conference about the opportunity to publish in Nigotera. Uh, uh, participants of the second section, uh, please disconnect and connect, disconnect from this, uh, this uh, channel and connect separately uh, to the second section. Uh, contact. The participants of the first second uh, section, first section stay here. The first section, History, Historiography and Bibliography of the Periodical, will be moderated by Associate Professor Dr. Ayla Mulgrew. Uh, the second section, Heritage of Periodical and Digitalization, and we, uh, will be moderated by Associate Professor Dr. Niola Blutigan. It means information about uh, how we work in this section, moderators, yeah, instruction, got in emails. I think uh, all um, of our conference uh, uh, in these two days uh, will be um, good and uh, we have a good uh, opportunity, opportunity after conference to publish our research. Uh, it, I think that is all if, uh, if you have any questions about our conference in the after 
Uh, after 10 minutes, it will be uh, early. I think that 10 minutes is way to not the best thing because if I'm very quickly greeting uh, uh, if moderators uh, uh, want, uh, we could do uh, our, our first section uh, take uh, earlier how moderators, moderators think more uh, and I love. To wait uh, 10 minutes or, or not? I uh, your microphone. Uh, uh, yes, uh, if if all the speakers are, are ready and, and present, then we can start uh, right now. So, um, as I understand, our first speaker, E. Remo, is, uh, is here. Here. He's to start. So, mm -hmm. in principle, uh, I think we can, we can uh, um, carry on and, and start the session. And how do you all think? Uh, because uh, in, in a second section, we will disconnect uh, from this first uh, section. Yes, uh, yes. <clears throat> we have disconnect and switch to to our session, and uh, I think we follow the program uh, because we have some minutes. But uh, it's it's the right. kind of us. <laughs> so we are. Yeah. I am ready. <laughs> okay. I, I think uh, yeah, we, we won't wait uh, nine minutes and uh, can uh, uh, this section uh, uh, do uh, yes. take in this time. Yes, l let's do it by the let's program and take, right, right. take some minutes for switching to We the have more time for questions. Yes. Thank you, Dean and uh, the director, uh, uh, prorector for, for the different speeches. I know we have a lot of business in this day. Thanks. Thank you, and have a nice conference. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank have a nice you. day. And thank you for, um, nice. for invitation to disconnect us. <laughs> have a great con <laughs> conference, really. The, the topics are insightful, so wish everyone the good time here at the conference. So enjoy. Thanks. And uh, I left uh, more for you. Yes, yes, thank you. So, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I am Ayla Muldre from the Tallinn University and act as a moderator of the first session of our uh, uh, today's conference uh, that is dedicated to history, uh, historiography and bibliography of periodicals. And before we uh, uh, start with the presentation, some remarks about uh, the organization of the session. Uh, questions, questions that are very really welcome. Um, can, uh, can be asked uh, uh, using your microphones or um, uh, writing the questions in chat. And um, if we have time after the presentation, then uh, the presenter um, uh, shall um, answer the questions um, right after the presentation, but otherwise we have time for uh, the questions and answers after the sessions during the uh, discussion uh, that uh, starts at the end of the first um, day at about uh, two o'clock, as I understand. So, um, and uh, the other thing, as we, we are doing it via the way, there might be that somebody experiences some technical difficulties. And if a, a presenter can't start at uh, the appointed time, um, we shall carry on with the next speaker. And uh, um, the presenter who, who couldn't start at the right time uh, will start um, uh, like uh, the uh, last um, presenter of the session. So uh, everybody will have the chance, but but uh, maybe the order will change. But hopefully everything will happen um, okay and, and we can carry on as the um, program uh, shows us. So, uh, and now we are 
ready to, to start uh, the presentations. And our first speaker today is uh, Dio Remo um, from uh, Estonia, Estonian book historian, uh, bibliographer and librarian. She has a wide experience in academic work, both at uh, the Tallinn University and the Academic Library. And today she'll treat the emergence of uh, the Estonian language periodical press, the first periodical publications in the Estonian language. So please, Theo, the, the floor is yours. Um, Okay, now, now the microphone is on. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I would uh, uh, like to express my gratitude to the organizers of uh, uh, this conference and wish them enthusiasm and strength to continue these international meetings of book historians and uh, uh, as well uh, the enthusiasm in the research on the history of the Lithuanian rich uh, book culture. Um, my presentation uh, will uh, concentrate uh, uh, on the emergence of the Estonian language periodical press. Uh, that is uh, to establish um, the Estonian language periodical publication uh, before the middle of the 19th century. Uh, some remarks about the background that had great impact on publishing in the Estonian language. There were major differences in the social hierarchy, uh, hierarchy of that time. Great majority of Estonians were peasants and serfdom lasted till 1820s. But it was only in the second half of the 19th century when peasants got the right to buy the land out from their former landlords. The possibilities to get even primary education uh, was for Estonians difficult. Uh, the parish schools founded for peasant children had their main idea in religious education and only few Estonians had before the middle of the 19th century possibility to continue studies. For the long time, the upper class language in Estonia was German and German publications were in a certain way models as well as sources for information to Estonian ones. The dawn of Estonian language printed matter was in the hands of educated foreigners, estophiles, mainly Lutheran pastors. In the 17th century, it was religious literature. In the second half of the 18th century, also the books on practical content like agricultural and medical advices or cooking were published for Estonians. Also the attempts to establish Estonian language periodical publications were made. First, I would like to draw your attention uh, to the first continuous publication. Uh, some researchers consider calendars as periodical publications, some consider them uh, as books. Uh, calendars, a small yearly published notebooks which gave information about the forthcoming year, weather prognosis and supplementary reading materials were widely spread. Uh, German language calendars compiled by the man of local origin, Lambertus Kemmerling, started to come out at the end of the 16th century. The first Estonian language calendar came into being in 1720s. The first one perhaps for 1720, as considered by the book historian and bibliographer Endelanus. The oldest survived Estonian language calendar is from the year 1732. 
By the middle of the 19th century, nine Estonian language calendars were published in Estonian printing houses. Uh, as to journals, it was quite difficult to find enough readers, even for German language ones. The first attempts were made on the second half of the 18th century on agricultural and healthcare topics. Physician Peter Ernst Wilde as the editor and publisher. Wilde was born in Berlin, studied at Königsberg University and came to the center of Kurland, Jelgava, Mito at that time in 1765. The next year he moved to Bultsama in southern part of Estonia uh, that, was, that belonged to Livonian government at that time, where he established the printing office, opened the hospital and the pharmacy. His first weekly, the Der Landarzt, the country doctor, was issued in Jelgava in 1765. The annual volume of it he finished in Bultsama under the name of Livlandische Abhandlungen der Landwirtschaft, uh, Livonian Treatise on Medical Science. After the break for three years, he went on with a new annual volume of 1770, which was reprinted in 1782. He tried once again with a German language weekly after two and a half years in Yelga under the name of Der Praktische Landarzt, the practical country doctor. With the uh, ideas to spread health care and animal breeding advices was not meant only for Germans, but also for Estonians and Latvians. In a way, he was the founder of the first Estonian language journal, known by the first words of its title, Lyhikopetus, the brief precepts. Although it would have been impossible without the local pastor and the man of letters, August Wilhelm Huppel, who translated the content from Wilde's German man manuscript. Uh, 41 numbers of the journal were published since November 1766 till probably October 1767. The magazine consisted of medical advices for healthcare and household hygiene, warnings against superstition and intemperance. The Latvian journal of the same kind, uh, Latvish Arste, Latvian doctor, was also published in Bultsama, altogether 25 numbers in 1768-69. Wilde's manuscript was by that time developed for a book and published in 1770. Also that was translated into Estonian by August Wilhelm Huppe. Uh, the next Estonian language uh, continuous publication uh, came into being after more than 70 years. In 1848-49, Heinrich Lachmann in Tartu published five issues of the Almanac titled Ma ilmi ja mõnda, misal siis on, The World and What You Can Find in the Air. Its editor and contributor was uh, Friedrich Reinhold Kreuzwald, uh, Estonian. Uh, the model and partly the source material was taken from German books and periodicals. It was the first popular scientific journal containing articles about the outer space, foreign countries, their inhabitants, flora and fauna, and illustrated by uh, the woodcuts by Tato artists. Alongside the former, uh, the continuous publication directly used as a propaganda tool, was printed in Pärnu. Leivakorvikene kõpetused ja jutustamised maarahva kasuks üles pantud. A little bread basket or instructions and conversations compiled for country people. It came out in 12 issues in 1847-49. The compilers, the pastors, Friedrich Wilhelm Hasselblatt von Karuse and Ernst Wilhelm Schulz von Pärnu, 
uh, tried with religious short stories and didactic articles to fight against the conversion of Estonians into the Russian Orthodox faith, encouraged at that time by Russian authorities. The third continuous publication was started by the government official Friedrich Nikolai Russov in Tallinn, uh, entitled Tallinna Kodaniku Raamat oma sõpradele maale, the book of the citizen of Tallinn to his friends in the country. Uh, Twelve issues on news about the Crimean war consisted uh, consisting each of 8 to 32 pages were published during 1854 to 1857. All uh, named three belonged to the type of the so-called one-man magazines. They were designed like books, had continuous pagination, were afterwards bound together and sold as books. The first German language newspapers were issued in Tallinn and in Riga at the end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th centuries. The model was taken from the newspapers published at that time. Uh, uh, the Tallinn uh, uh, papers model was taken from the newspapers published at the time in Riga. Uh, both papers in Riga and in Tallinn mediated news from the European commercial centres and bigger towns, had very little local news and reached their end during the Great Northern War in 1710. In Tallinn, it took more than, 780, uh, than 60 years when in 1772 uh, the weekly paper Revolse Wöchentliche Nachrichten came into being. At the end of the 18th century, the other German language newspaper, Dörpche Zeitung, uh, was established in Tartu. The first attempt to issue an uh, Estonian language newspaper uh, was made at the beginning of the 19th century in Tartu. The publisher and printer, Mikael Gerhard Grenzius, uh, started to issue the newspaper Tartu Mara a weekly paper for Tartu country people, in March 1806. The editor, uh, editors were pastors, Johann Philipp Roth, uh, Gustav Aldorf Oldekop, and the school inspector from Boru, Karl August von Roth. The content of the paper was censored by the censorship committee of the Tartu University, uh, which was established 1804. The great part of its articles were translated from the Grenzius German newspaper, Der Zeitung, but also from the other German newspapers and journals which were issued in Russia. Altogether, uh, 43 numbers were issued. There were articles about foreign countries and local events, practical tips and advices for household, statistical overviews and short stories, mainly anecdotes. As Napoleon wars in Europe were the main news in the newspapers of that time, quite many messages about the war events, battles and movement of armies were also mediated to Estonian readers. Uh, that become uh, the main reason for closing the newspaper in December 1806. The closing decision was made by the Russian Militia Committee, Komitet Lyaglavnava Prezvodstva Dielba Militiam. The Russian government had declared the war against France in November 1806. At the beginning of December, the non-commissioned officers were summoned back to service. French and their ally state citizens in Russia had to register themselves at police offices. The task of this committee was to take precautions against possible riots of peasants in Russian governments in connection with organization of militia troops and the additional army recruitment numbers. 
The situation in the Baltic provinces was alarming and insecure. Napoleon had shown himself as a brilliant leader and the Baltic provinces were one of the closest to be in danger. In addition, rumours were spread that Napoleon would put the end to serfdom. By the end of 1806, Estonian and Livonian governments had to get together 28,000 men for militia and give 3,000 new recruits. In addition, the weather condition uh, was not favourable. The crops failed and promised food problems in the near future. Local landlords were afraid of riots and did not want uh, the newspaper to spread the information about the situation among the peasants. In its session, uh, the 19th of December 1806, the committee decided, among the other measures, uh, the free translation of that uh, decision is the following. The committee could not let out of notice the newspaper, which is published for common people in the Estonian language in Tartu and contains articles uh, on war and other political matters. Committee finds it indispensable to close this newspaper immediately because of the fact that the separate newspaper is published for peasants. In addition, in the language, which is not understandable, not only for authorities, but also the, to the Tartu University on the censorship of which it comes out. It is not only unuseful, but even harmful. Even in the case that these publications have no hidden ulterior motives, informing the peasants about the irrelevant matters for them is not beneficial. The publishers of such things would use their cap cap capabilities better, strengthening pe peasants' religiousness inspiring their faith to the emperor who fully takes care of them and the assiduity in their obligations to their legal landlords. The publisher, Mikael Gerhard Krenzius, was informed about the decision of the committee on uh, 9th of January 1807 and had to sign the corresponding order. The day before, all copies of the anonymous German language booklet about the situation of peasants in Estonia and Livonia were confiscated at his uh, typography. The author of the booklet was in fact the professor of the university, legal historian Johann Philipp Gustav Evers. The second attempt to publish the Estonian language newspaper was made by Otto Wilhelm Masing, the pastor of Fonaxi. He was the editor and producer of Mara Fonadalalet, the Country People Weekly. This newspaper was published in 1821 to 23, and once more in 1825. Each year, 52 numbers were issued. The layout of the newspaper resembled a book. It was in octavo format, consisting usually from eight, sometimes from 12 pages. Masing had some contributors, but in fact, it was also a one-man publication, presenting popular descriptions and overviews on different topics, thus contributing to its readers' development and education. There were also private advertisements, market news, and some didactic short stories. What makes this newspaper valuable is the fact that Marsing started to publish lists of recently published books or short annotations, establishing in that way the bibliography of Estonian books as well as the tradition of literary criticism. But there were too few subscribers, uh, somewhere between 150 to 250, publishing what not, was not profitable and Masing had uh, to give it up.
It took a bit more than 30 years when the parish clerk of Norm, Johann Waldemar Janssen, founded the newspaper uh, Perno Postimes Eknadalilet, the Perno Postman or Weekly. Uh, the newspaper was published in Perno by Friedrich Wilhelm Born, uh, later by his successors. The newspaper was in quarto format, consisting the, uh, eight pages, text printed in two columns, with chatty, instructive and practically oriented articles. It brought the world to peasants' household, taught the readers to read and to need newspapers. It became a tool for stimulating national consciousness, drew on the changes of the society, the economic rise, development of schools, uh, founding the libraries. The rubric of replies to readers' letters and contributions to the newspaper show that this newspaper evolved the contact with its readers. It was the most important newspaper for Estonians till 1863, when Janssen, who had moved to Tartu, founded the new uh, paper, Eesti Postimes, Estonian Postman. Perno Postimes lost its popularity in 1885. It was bought by Carl August Hermann, moved to Tartu and published under the title Postimes till uh, 1940. Estonian peri periodical press uh, had been born. To conclude, the formation of Estonian periodical press took about 100 years. The infancy began with a journal, Louis Kerpettus. During 1767 to 1806, no Estonian magazines or newspapers appeared, only the German press developed. The first attempt to establish the Estonian language newspaper in 1806 failed because the contraction of Russian authorities as well as of the Estonian and Livonian nobilities. The following attempts still contributed to the development of the Estonian press, educating the readers. All these early publications before the Perno Postimes had no commercial profit, were editor-centered, but aimed to enlighten, educate and instruct the people and also gave shape to the peculiarly Estonian press as much as the restrictions and censorship in the Russian Empire made it possible. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> and now we have uh, some minutes for questions. So, please, if uh, somebody likes to ask something from Dio. Dear, dear to you, thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, and I would like to ask one question. It it was it, it is not um, uh, from your topic, but as you are uh, a historian, not in the book but in periodicals as well, uh, I am uh, interesting very much in last years in the origin of scholarly, first scholarly uh, periodicals in Lithuania. Uh, what do you think? Uh, in Lithuania, it was the period uh, uh, of Imper Imperial Vilnius University, and about in the second decade, um, uh, uh, a periodical, Dzienik uh, Wilenski in Polish, was established. And I think that according to his, uh, his um, thematic uh, things and uh, uh, according and because the authors who published uh, articles in this uh, periodical, it could be called the first scholarly uh, periodical in Lithuania. What is the situation in, in Estonia? What do you think? And maybe you have, have been interested in, in such, such uh, things. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, actually, the first uh, periodical publications in uh, scientific periodical yeah. publications how we can take them uh, were um, established at the beginning of the 20th century 
uh, they were um, at that time after the um, revolution of uh, yeah. 1905 07 uh, several estonian also we can call them scientific societies were created mm -hmm, yeah. and uh, the first uh, periodicals were on the field of estonian language and literature mm -hmm. uh, i just can't um, tell you the yeah, exact yeah, title of it yeah, yeah. but but at that time uh, they started to appear and of course uh, um, many publications uh, of scientific content uh, started to appear in already in the Estonian Republic after 1920 but perhaps uh, Isla can also um, well add something to that <laughs> Well, I, I think the German language uh, scholarly yes. journal appeared uh -huh. uh, already uh, during the 19th century. Yes. So yes. It, but the Estonian language, yes, this started. started and later. Isla, those journals were published in the uh, territory of Estonia, German? Yes. In German? Yes. 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 Uh, uh, Mm, that was uh, uh, actually quite an interesting journal. Uh, was published already in the middle of the 19th century, yeah. the inland. Uh, mm -hmm. It had um, uh, quite a lot of articles about uh, history and uh, uh, what kind of uh, research was done and Baltic Germans also started the archaeological excavations in yeah. Estonia and so on. Uh, but yeah, uh, the Estonian ones came later uh, because, um, uh, well, uh, uh, at uh, Tartu University in the 19th century, uh, there were very few Estonian students. Uh, quite many people went to St. Petersburg to yeah, study at that, yeah. uh, uh, study yeah. there. And so it is a bit uh, more, more, uh, more, more difficult. Uh, they came back and and started. Um, uh, well, together also these uh, uh, Estonian language old books and such sort of things. Um, but already in the 19th century, uh, the Baltic German Estophites started that collecting of uh, uh, Estonian language uh, um, and uh, Estonian language books and uh, uh, the first bibliography of the Estonian language literature was also published in the 19th century, but yeah. not by the Estonians. Yeah, thank you very much for both of you for comments and information important. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, now we can move uh, to our second speaker today. Uh, Monika Lekowska. Hopefully she is uh, ready. I don't see Monika. Hello. Is is Monika Lekowska present? Uh, I see she isn't participating now. Okay, okay. In that case, we shall move uh, uh, to the next speaker, Birute Railiene. Hopefully, she has joined uh, us. I'm sorry, Birute is on this uh, on this uh, chat, but she has some uh, technical issues, and we are solving it right now. So we need uh, a few minutes. Okay, uh, let us wait. Let us wait for Biruta Railiene. Uh, she comes from the Roblevsky Library of uh, the Lithuanian Academy of Sciences. 
uh, and uh, she uh, studies uh, open access to scholarly information uh, for the history of science and um, history of chemistry in particular. But today she'll be not talking about uh, chemistry, but um, the uh, first um, satirical weekly paper Hello. in Lithuania. Armania Girdita. Taip, taip. Girdita. Aš galiu kalbėti. Taip, Biruta, jūs tik ką Moderator. Gerai. Gerai. Labą dieną. Uh, dear colleagues, can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes we can. Uh, uh, mm, at first of all, I would like to apologize for my name. Here you see me as Rutas Majinine, though I am Beruta Railine. This is a, a joint computer. So uh, here it is my pleasure to be with you. And now I will try to share my slide. Uh, where is it? Entire screen here. Yes, and um, uh, the computer man just left, and uh, I think I will manage. Yes, I would like to present a weekly paper, Pavement News, uh, in Polish, Radomosti Brukowy. Published in Vilnius during 1816-1822, Pemen News was a weekly satiric paper, first of its kind issued in Lithuania. It was the first satiric paper in Polish language. It was overtaken by the Society of Rascals in Polish, in Polish, Towarzystwo Szubrawców as its official tribune. You see this short glossary of the terms I'm using in my paper. The society uh, itself deserves a special, this, this society of rascals uh, deserves a special study, but the paper will present only some facts. Almost all members were respectable professors of Vilnius University or honorable community representatives. The idea of a society was humor and good temper. The weekly paper was disseminated in Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, and even Russia. Authors did their best to ridicule the faults of the society, like greed, drinking, etc. Their special weapon, sometimes very sharp, was satara. Um, the paper will present a short survey of the weekly paper as a platform used to comment the latest events of society life in Vilnius. The payment news was banned in 1822 by the regime of Russian Empire. Payment news was the first satirical newspaper published on the territory of the gra former Grand Duchy of Lithuania. We could not find any other older title that met the criteria of satirical periodical published in Polish language. However, in our study, we will not discuss this fact in more detail. Our special attention will be given to the attitude of the public uh, pavement news on the rising Lithuanian national self-concept. Analysis of the content of the pavement news will not reveal the true value of the publication if we do not discuss the historical circumstances of the appearance of the publication and its authors. In Lithuania, the Freemasons' influence played a role in the appearance of secret societies that still the patriotic spirits and resistance against the Russian authorities. Both the Freemasons and the organizations they founded were engaged in educational activities, charity, promoted a healthy lifestyle and 
in general tended to give for the progress of society and against any oppression. Stanislav Moravsky, uh, a, a nobleman, physician, a writer of 19th century, the author of famous memoirs about Vilnius, called Vilnius and its university of that time a volcano, which, like some hot lava, from which, like hot lava, all sorts of new ideas sprung, mostly awakened by the ideas of the Enlightenment and the Great French Revolution. An idea of founding a society based on humor and good mood became attractive to many. Before long, the activity of a new society among the cultural and literature of Bohemia was discussed. The main generators of this idea were Kazimeras Kontrimas, Jakub Shumkiewicz, Leonas Borowskis, Jan Gisnedetsky, and others. The society chose the name of Rascals in Polish Towarzystwo uh, Szopraso and rallied about 30 members of the majority of whom were Vilnius University professors and prominent intellectuals of the city. The secrecy was a must for the society, since the members had to sign an address when other in pseudonyms, the names were chosen from Lithuanian mythology. Yet it was achieved both with humor and respect to early history of Lithuania. Very likely this idea occurred to Kazimieras Kontrimas, a librarian at Venus University, a liberal and participant of the 1794 Kostyushko uprising, he exerted considerable influence on the city's literary, academic and public life. Before official announcement about establishing this society, a format of activities was discussed. The society needed an official tribune a publication for the essays penned by its members. An idea of a bulletin or daily for the society was discussed. And then the anonymous publication, which has already gained an attention of citizens, was remembered. Here is a short story about it. In August 1816, leaflets with printed text were scattered on the pavement in front of the Vilnius Town Hall. You see the place in the picture. The leaflets had a title, the pavement news or a conversation of a big X with a small X in Town Hall Square. Mes matom jūsų pirmą skaidrą su pavadinimu ir... O ką man daryti dabar? Virūta, jūs širinkit ne skaidrės, o širinkit... Jūs širinkit ekraną, o tai reikia paširinti skaidrės tiesiog. Nes mes matom jūsų ekraną kopiją. Jeigu jūs galit tikėjau skaidrės... Pendrinti pastaskite, paskui yra naršyti mano kompiuterį ir pasirinkite skaidrės. Pendrinti viršui. Naršyti ten apačioj ir pasirinkite skaidrį. Tai tada jums parodys skaidrį. Oh, my goodness. Share. Share screen or window. Ir apačioj ten iš kažkur paimti. Galima iš kažkur paimti. Entire screen. Nu, aš patalau. Ten turi būti nuorada, iš kur galima paimti skaidrį. Nu, kad iš galima iš kompiuterio užkrauti jas, o ne vien tik... Ar jūs nusintum kaip galvojate, Kristina? Taip, aš nusintčiau skaidrės. Gerai, Kristinos paprašykime tą skaidrės užgėsim. Tai aš to jau pasidalinsiu, tik tai primenu, kad kai reikės kitą skaidrę, vis pasakykit. Gerai. Aš skaidrės sustojot? Gerai, aš sustojau. O, tu. Taip. Taip, we can go one by one, glossary, it was a short glossary of the terms, and now stop at the, yes, and now go down, 
until the yes okay. down down and down next yes this is a picture you see the very first issue of the uh, pavement news and the place where it was scattered just in front of the red house now the second picture yes here before long uh, they appeared more leafless and it was the second issue of the pavement news the pavement news or a stroll on a castle hill and on the picture you see the old view of the castle like, like it looked in 18th century um, as it turned out later the text were penned by emmanuel lachnitsky ignacy emmanuel lachnitsky who was then 23 years old at the time it was a great event not only for the community of Vilnius, but also for the members of the Rascal Society. One person was a connection to both uh, um, Pavement News and Society of Rascal, Kazimieras Kontripas. He was the one who encouraged and assisted young Lachnitsky to publish the first uh, um, Pavement News. Both issues included Felgertons and gossip from the life of Vilnius. The style of a newspaper was light and it was brimming with allusions to the life of the city, which would be not clear to a visitor or a person from a different epoch. It's like he talked about us. The public of Vilnius was hungry for new issues of pavement news. This newspaper seemed to fit the purpose of the official publication of the society perfectly. Lachnitsky was invited to join the society. He received the name Zizis Lad. After number seven in January 1817, until the last issue, payment news appeared regularly on Saturdays. Stanislav Moravsky, I mentioned this name already. Uh, the reader of Pavement News gave an excellent description of the newspaper. A quote, this newspaper, best understood and perceived only in Lithuania, had an unprecedented success here due to its jokes. It was sought after across the whole country. You could find it both in a manor or a tavern, the noble on a magic shovel, Show, uh, it was the vignette of the newspaper, would find his way everywhere, in the city and in the village, spread gossip relentlessly and ruthlessly ridicule everyone. Curiosity was overcome by panic, fear for finding one's own portrait depicted in the newspaper. Not surprising, the president of the Rascal Society was Jan J. Snedetsky, a man known to the world for his learning, a man brimming with original wit or joke writing. Here I am saying it once again, everyone famous in Lithuania for his wit or learning was a member of the Society of Rascals. Today, however, only a very few would be capable of measuring the ranging sea of irony, salt and humor without more detailed explanation. Our descendants will find it difficult to understand it. Truth to be told, even then in Vilnius, not all uh, people in Vilnius not always understood who was the object of one joke or another. The says would be sent from Polotsk, Vitebsk, Shoulay or Grodno. The only requirement for the offers of Pavement news was a light and amusing Shubravsi style and the avoidance of all historical, geographical and mythological errors. Next slide, please. On June 18 of 1817, the Shubravsi meeting in full session accepted the code. It consisted of 16 basic rules which describe the aims, procedures, and the internal order of a new society listed the targets of satire. 
and on the picture you see the nobleman uh, flowing on the uh, baking peel or lije in Lithuanian. So he was the one who noticed all the wrong things and described uh, in the newspaper. The code uh, of Shobrats consisted, as I mentioned, um, of 16 rules, but because of a lack of a time, I will quote only a few. Rule number four. All of the members received pseudonyms, sometimes multiple. For the most part, the names were selected from the ancient mythology of Lithuania. Rule number five. Duties imposed on each member of a society. First of all, one had to fulfill the obligation of his membership by showing good example, by reforming himself first. The self-education of the waters. To read one book every month, to have at least 10 books in one library, to constantly read at least one political and one literary magazine. The authors could choose topics freely for writing, but he had to keep in mind that pavement news is a source of knowledge from the streets of Vilnius. Each member of a society during the years was obliged to collect as much knowledge as possible about the mythological creatures whose name he chose. Such was the member's contribution to the creation of the Lithuanian mythology. The whole rule 13 was devoted to the role of the editor of the pavement news. It was a responsibility of the editor to publish regularly the, the weekly, so that if, even there will be not sufficient material, the editor's duty was to publish the issue in respect to subscribers. The editor was responsible for all fines for grammatical, typographical and factual errors. One of the main circumstances a member will be expelled from the society in the ability to produce a promised article. Not like now. All articles were to be written in a light and a music style and with humor. Each member of the society was obliged to write an article of any content for the pavement news within 20 days. Next slide, please. 287 issues were published during 1816-1822. Uh, uh, it is the authorship that promises the greatest intrigue. The fact that all texts in pavement news were anonymous both created attention among the readers of the time and among scholars later. Members of the society had multiple nicknames which were used during meetings of the society, also mentioned in the text of the payment news. Major nicknames and pseudonyms of the society members were revealed in monographs by Josef Belinsky, Zdislav Skvarzynski, Luis Pedroti, Grzegorz Nitz, and others. Studies documenting the history of the society were published throughout in 20th century, but I have to note, not all the pay names are cleared even until now. Characters. As the prime model of, the ma of their magazine, however, uh, newspaper, however, Shubravtsin relied upon the famous English moral periodical of the 18th century, The Spectator. Shabravtsi regarded Swift, Stern and Goldsmith as their predecessors. In imitations of Swift Gulliver's travels, of Krasitsky's adventures of Dostoevsky, they often used the literary form of a voyage to unknown countries or descriptions of local customs. The main characters of periodicals mentioned above were just watching life and customs, never entering into conversation with local people, but they criticized, and a lot. Spectator believed in a use of a good advice, 
Shubravtsi were more inclined in satire. It happened that Shubravtsi even translated almost literally whole articles of the English periodical without acknowledging the source. The next slide, please. The, the main characters of Payman News, the nobleman on the baking peel and the idler philosopher shape different perspectives of satirical assessment based on historical or philosophical knowledge on situated or anonymous critical thinking. They establish different critical positions, that of citizen and that of a philosopher intellectual, and strategies for dealing with historical particulars, self-criticism, provocation, and transformation on one hand, and selection, rejection, and substitution on the other. A series of articles given le as letters or observations in Gulliver, taken down by a member of Shebravtsi society, presented Gulliver's surprises about the customs of the country about which he tells to members of Shebravtsi society. Shemkevich's character of a nobleman mm, on the baking peel became a rallying figure for the collective authorship of the Shabravsi society and was used in satires by many of authors. Unfortunately, we would never know who was the author of which article. The fact that the character was so easily appropriated by the other satirists indicates that his local socio-cultural background, which included attributes of Lithuanian Polish culture from of a former Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and the historical memory of Commonwealth was true match for the collective identity both of Shubravtsi and of the reading community. How much time do I have left? Should I? Mm, uh, uh, three, three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, yes. so please, uh, please the next slide. It will be conclusions which you can read and I will uh, just add some some text. Um, what I very important uh, about um, about the character of idler philosopher created by Snadetsky was um, the beginning of his satirical cycle with a philosophical praise of idleness. Snadetsky chose the model of treatise or a parodist scientific study of all the possible form texts that may be borrowed by satire as many times done in the Domosti Brukove, or pavement news. It was news, reports, letters, personal announcements, publication of a discovered manuscript, anecdotes, etc. This is choice of genre became an authorial mark of Snedesky's satire. And um, uh, Snedetsky, uh, in the very first of his um, papers, uh, explained that uh, his dream, uh, not his, but this philosopher's dream, is to work on the uh, zoology of Vilnius, a systematic description of types of city people. Quote, what and if I ever was a botanist or a zoologist, and if I could speak their language, I would describe the attributes of each of the creatures walking down the pavement, classifying them into the right and appropriate class and species. And here is uh, here I would like to uh, to stop and um, thank you for the attention. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. <clears throat> so, we we might take time for a very uh, a quick question, if uh, anybody has it right now. Ruta, thank you very much for your paper. And yeah. I have a small question, if I may. Yeah. Uh, 
It is a very interesting phenomenon uh, this Wiadomości uh, Brukowe. Uh, do you do you think uh, does it have a prototype in some European countries or in European culture, or does it was very original, <clears throat> periodical, in broader view of European culture? What do you think? Or maybe it 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 could be a new direction of the research. Uh, you know, thank you for the question. It is a very, uh, very good question. I can, I can talk uh, all day about it. <laughs> uh, I think uh, this um, uh, newspaper or these leaflets, they were like a virus. They, they uh, encouraged other, uh, other journalists, other authors uh, to, to do something like this. Uh, I said that it was the first satirical uh, newspaper uh, in Polish, so it is the first Polish satirical um, newspaper, though it was published in Vilnius, um, because other, uh, there were some uh, drawings before in Great Duchy of Lithuania, but these were like episodes in other literature journals satirical uh, series, uh, one or, or another. Uh, but to have the newspaper from cover to the end, satirical, so this was the first. And it didn't have analog uh, then. Later, yes, it, it, when it was closed in 1822, uh, some different titles appeared, uh, but it was uh, in, in other countries. We know that Tsarist regime was very severe in Lithuania, so it was not that easy. But uh, talking about Vedomost Brukov, the original name, so we had in Vilnius, uh, in uh, uh, 1932, Tadeusz Wroblewski, the founder of our library, he started the Vadimashe Brukova again. It was few few issues. It, it was and and then in 2005, again Vadimashe Brukova was started by Polish community, but it was only a few issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. the discussion during the discussion session. But now, uh, has uh, Monika Lekowska joined us? Hello. Hello. Yes. Can you hear Hello. me? Hello. Yes. Hello. 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 I am very I'm very sorry for the delay, but I have uh, I had laptop problems, so maybe I can uh, that is, fix that is all that is OK. Uh, so okay. Monika Lekowska comes from Pedagogical University of Krakow. Uh, she is a graduate of Historical Tourism and Cultural Heritage and uh, her research interests are history of the mentality of the modern period, historical tourism, uh, protection of cultural heritage and today uh, her presentation is under a very intriguing title from spy to editor. Please, please Monica. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Um, please let me know if you can see already my presentation. Yes, yes, yes. 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 That's fantastic. So uh, the title of my presentation for today is From Spy to Editor, Informants of Elżbiet Lesieniawska and Lubomirska, the Castellan of Krakow, or actually the wife of the Castellan of Krakow. Studies on female epistolography from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth of the Saxon era have been conducted for decades. Source editions of correspondence sent and received by noble women are published supplementing the picture of mentality of society living in the early modern period. Elżbieta Sieniawska, née Lubomirska, wife of the Castellan of Krakow, is a historical figure that is especially valued in research on the Saxon era. She was a daughter of the Grand Crown Marshal Stanisław Herakliusz Lubomirski and Zofia Neopalinska. 
Elżbieta Sieniawska, was a woman of great cunningness, intelligence and resourcefulness. Her activity from the turn of the 18th century went down in a history as one of the most dynamic female initiatives in economy and culture. What is worth to say, um, compilations of correspondence between the most popular editors and their benefactress are an important source of studies on Sieniawska's informants. The corpus of letters and handwritten newspapers uh, called in Polish Avise, belonging to Sieniawska, opens up a wide scientific horizon before researches of the Saxon era. Nevertheless, the material is only fragmentary. Today, I would like to present briefly some interesting facts about spies and editors working for Elżbieta Sieniawska, whose collaboration has not been tackled more broadly in any publication. This research deals with this correspondence of Sieniawska, who mainly served as her informants, relying news both from the country and abroad. It is worth highlighting that while some of them were professional postmen or male editors, others engaged solely in denunciation and gossip. Each piece of information seemed a highly desired commodity, and for this reason, rather than taken lightly, it was checked and confirmed. Before 1729, uh, traditional handwritten newspapers were a very important source of knowledge about politics, culture, economy, current affairs, and silent gossip both within the territory of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, regular newspapers appeared later than in other parts of Europe. Essentially, this delay was caused by a low societal demand for mass-printed newspapers, since handwritten informational correspondence was extremely popular. Until the 1750s, literally, anyone could edit a newspaper. By the end of the 17th century, thirst for knowledge about the world had also caught up with Elżbieta Sieniawska, who sought to gather as much information as possible about current affairs in politics, social life and trade. Undoubtedly, she was one of the best informed women in Poland. Handwritten newspapers are a specific source of studies on any period. Today, we know personal data of some of the creators, what remains problematic, though are periodicals with no signature or initials. Usually the identification of the creators of newspapers is possible through a comparison of the handwritten used in newspapers and letters. On the other hand, it is limited by the available of the correspondence. The names of informants listed on the slide, among whom we can find both self-proclaimed spies and professional editors, function in the available literature as figures described more or less thoroughly. Today I would like to shed a light on a few less extensively researched news providers who worked for Sieniawska, Jan Antoni Lamprecht, Gottfried Gebhardt, Michal Kurzecki, Piotr Skene, and members of the Priami family are excellent examples of extremes in the circles of Sieniawska's information services. For many years, Sieniawska worked to establish her position in the country, at the court and in politics. Her relationship with the Queen and longtime friend Marie Kazimir Darkien Sobieska allowed her to initiate a continuous correspondence with Jean Antoine Lampre, more widely known as Jan Antoni, the Polish equivalent of his name. Most probably, Lamprecht came from France. The preserved correspondence suggests that he had a very good command of Polish. Therefore, one can deduct that he spent a relatively long time in the, in the Commonwealth. He served Marie Casimir loyally until around 1698, but um, when the Queen left for Rome, Lamprecht fell under Sieniawska's authority, who was married to a voivode of Belgrade at the time. Furthermore, 
um, he had known Sieniawska for years due to her close relationship with the Queen. As an administrator and uh, as an administrator and informant, he traveled between Sobieski's and later the Sieniawski's estates. Surely he was one of the most resourceful and inventive informant working for Sieniawska. He sent he sent letters and newspapers as often as two to three times per month, what made him a very reliable informant. But when this frequency waked, he explained, I do apologize this time, as this is perhaps not due to my laziness, but the news about you, my dear lady at Benefactor's arrival. Most likely he gained knowledge from his own observations Lamprecht would point out that he was aware of the importance of the validity and veracity of the sent mail. He told Tushinevska, any report should be true. Lamprecht easily reported on politics. In one of his letters, the, he described operations of Swedish troops, whereas in another he informed about the Sapiha's maneuvers in the Diet. In yet another informational letter to Sieniawska, he used a more targeted personal narration, and he wrote about her father. Rumor has it that his dear lord and benefactor, Grand Crown Marshal, has one leg and one arm paralyzed. But people of this kind can live, and this is my curari. Since the beginning of the 18th century, the circle of private informants of Elżbieta Sieniawska included a certain Michał Tchórzecki or Tchórzecki. To correctly specify Sieniawska's informant, who appears in the most documents and letters, we need to establish that today I would like to present the activity of Michał Tchórzecki, a priest and private informant working for Elżbieta Sieniawska, the correspondence by other informants suggests that he delivered mail from news agents directly to Sieniawska, letters by Jakub Kazimierz Rubinkowski, a councillor of Toruń, and Sieniawska's postmaster suggests that there was some kind of rivalry between him and Chorzecki, most probably over favors of specific benefactors. Also, he must have sent valuable and meticulously recorded parliamentary journals to Sieniawska. A certain factual aspect that can be subjected to doubt are the articles of the Treaty of Vienna of 1719. Chorzecki wrote them in Latin and reported that the king of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth supposedly declared his support for the Allies. Kurzecki also cooperated with Gottfried Gebhardt, who was presented in the correspondence to Sieniawska as a man scrupulous in reporting on information flow. He was very punctual as to mail delivery, what he underlined. I addressed your letters punctually where they belonged, and I'm sending them back from where I am standing. He worked for Sieniawska as a postman and an informant, but also a client. His German sounding name suggests his Western background. However, his fluency in Polish creates a certain cognitive dissonance. We know of German letters of his authorship, but they date to a later period. Most of the correspondence between Gebhardt and Sieniawska include informational letters referring to the postman's delivery schedules, reports on his work, occasional passing on news, and what is important for any client, reminding his benefactors of his presence. Uh, he sent letters with enclosed, usually local newspapers. From where I am now, I'm sending you back, my, my dear lady and benefactress, and enclosing a local newspaper. He informed Sieniawska about disease in the city, focusing on speed of its spreading and the high fatality rate suggesting its severity. I have this news about Lublin, that in these two houses, two people died this week on Thursday. A man who stole wood from the infected house also got sick, and he lives past the Bernardines. What is interesting, in March 1718, Gebhardt expressed his gratitude in the following words. I humbly thank you for 200 Polish zlotys of my compensation, which I received from Mr. Grabowski himself, who was in Lublin at the time. What is known? 
though, is the fact that he must have expanded his postal activities significantly after his benefactress's death. The latest known letter addressed to the informant was sent in February 1760 by a postmaster from Zamość. Among postmasters uh, working for Sieniawska, Piotr Skene deserves more attention. He left over 500 handwritten newspapers. Apart from standard postal services for Sieniawska, Skene worked as a merchant. He purchased valuable and extraordinary commodities for her. Compared to other informants, his payment was much higher, approximately 400 Polish zlotys per annum and an additional bonus of 10 zlotys for extra mail, for each extra mail delivery. His earnings varied depending on the recipient of the news. He sent his private observations together with the latest mail, parcels, newspapers and calendars. Basically, he informed Sieniawska about everything he managed to read, hear or see. In one of his letters, Kenny complained that last week in Krasnik, Mrs. Graf Marie Terra was marked. In the same letter, Skene reported that Mr. Desales passed away last Saturday. That information was important for Sieniawska herself and the postal environment of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth since Desales served as a postmaster for Sieniawska. Skene occasionally sent letters full of news from the world. He, he reported on problems of Valachian landlords and relocation of Turkish emperor's residence to Adrianople. Being a a good and exemplary postmaster, he did not forget about occasional wishes for Sieniawska, sending his greetings, greetings along with, the, with a reasonable postal report. Among the most serious newspapers uh, editors supplying Sieniawska with periodicals was Jerzy Aleksander Priami, died 1699. He was a newspaper publisher from Kraków, and he had a great understanding of events both within the country and around the world. It is not unlikely that even Elżbieta Sieniawska read Priami's work. Indeed, at the beginning of the century, a Priami were, wrote to Sieniawska, but it was not Jerzy Aleksander. The famous Kraków newspaper editor cannot have written any letters to Sieniawska at the time, since all available data show that he had passed away three years later. The initials used in the informational letters point to a different person who may have been related to the famous editor. The mysterious M.A. Priami from Kraków must have stayed in the contact with Sieniawska from the early 18th century onwards. The correspondence began in 1704. However, we read this letter. As always, I have been willing to fulfill any ordinance from you, my dear lady, and now I'm sending whatever news I have without delay. The postman at Sieniawska services sent her newspapers, both handwritten and printed. The informant provided his benefactress also with the news from Vienna. In one of his letters, Priami complained that there is no news from Vienna. The newspapers makes no mention whether whether Prince Elector of Bavaria should declare his allegiance to the Emperor as announced because the Vienna newspaper would immediately mention that, but it has yet to be confirmed. Furthermore, he reported on the presumed death of the Queen of Prussia, imperial contributions in Silesia and Prince Rakoczy's journey to Hungary. The duration of the correspondence is unknown, unfortunately. The correspondence ends in 1705. Despite the discrepancies in timing and geography, all the described figures are connected by the fact that each of them sent news to Elżbieta Sieniawska. Just as the title of this presentation says, it is worth highlighting that within her informational circus, um, Sieniawska assembled not only merchants and spies, but also recognized newspapers edi um, editors of the Saxon period. Despite a varied quality of the received news, Sieniawska urgently took advantage of every opportunity to acquire knowledge. Ongoing research on this group of people in part colour to the Teatrum Mundi of the early modern era and provides us 
with a broader picture of the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you. And um, now, uh, questions, please. Would anybody like to ask something? Right now, we have uh, some time for that. Um, ju just to clarify, um, uh, but uh, um, uh, Elspieta Sienjowska, she herself, she didn't uh, publish any newspaper. She just gathered information. Yes, that's right. She just uh, got some information from her editor's informational services. Yes, okay. And another thing, um, is there a special Elspieta um, Sinjavska uh, archive? Uh, or uh, what are the sources for the uh, study of her informants? Uh, yes, most of the sources from Elzbieta Sieniawska's uh, period and correspondence uh, is located in Kraków. Um, for me, it's a very good situation because I am also from Kraków, so uh, I can do my I can do my research in my in my own town. I do not have to go uh, very far away from from my city. But um, there is a very specific um, archive called. Prince, the Princess Czartoryski Library, maybe uh, you heard about this library, uh, where the main corpus of the correspondence of newspapers from for Sieniawska, uh, correspondence from Sieniawska to, to her informants, um, from the reci, reci, recipes um, by Sieniawska, by Sieniawska's administrators is located. There is also the National Archive in Krakow, uh, where the newspapers by Priami's family are also, um, I, I also, I, I also um, um, collected. And <clears throat> there is also quite interesting, um, quite interesting archive called a Central Archive of Historical Records in Warsaw, where I also could i also um, was able to collect some information informations for example about khuzetsky about scanner um yeah that's all i think good good thank you thank you uh, very much um any other questions uh, well um mm, uh, could you say uh, where the uh, so-called handwritten papers uh, widely spread in Poland at that time? Could you please repeat your question? Because um, I... uh, where the um, not printed or handwritten uh, newspapers widely spread in Poland at that time? Why? Because I, I do not understand the question. I heard something about the handwritten and printed newspapers, something about Poland, but... Um... Um, well, may, maybe I try to rephrase it. Uh, OK, uh, thank you very much. Were, were uh, the handwritten uh, newspapers typical in Poland at that time? Uh, were there many of them? Um, Handwritten newspapers were very, uh, ver very typical for the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, I think. Um, uh, I think until the 1750s, handwritten newspapers were the most famous newspapers in the Commonwealth. But also uh, there were some printed newspapers, but um, these printed newspapers uh, have hasn't been uh, so famous because of the um I have to check the word I'm sorry um 
um, inaccessibility uh, because of the noble, noble, noble people. Um, handwritten newspapers were much more famous because the uh, handwritten newspapers could be edited by anyone in this time. So I do Thank not you. know if I answer your question. Yes. But yes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, Thank you. Anybody else? No, it doesn't seem so. But in um, any case, we can we can carry on uh, during the discussion. So um, now we are having coffee. We have a coffee break until eleven o'clock. Then we shall uh, listen to two more presentations. So um, go and find some coffee. See you at 11 o'clock. <clears throat> so hello and uh, welcome back to everybody. It's now 11 o'clock and we shall continue uh, with the first session of the conference that is dedicated to um, history of periodicals. And our uh, uh, speaker um, who comes from Belgrade, uh, Dragana Gruic, is uh, uh, next and and uh, you you are prepared, as I see. Yes, yes, I am. Yes. First of all, I have to apologize. Uh, I have some problem with my computer, so this is uh, my daughter's computer, and her name is here. So sorry yeah. for that. And first yeah. of all, hello, uh, to everyone. Greetings from Serbia, from Belgrade University. I am really honored to uh, participate in this conference and to present my work. I hope that I'll manage to share my presentation. I cannot see here. Uh, if you find the share. Uh, yes. I, okay. Yes, but uh, like the tie don't have that privilege to share. Okay, so maybe I could share instead of you, you sent me your presentation. Oh, thank you. It will be great. Sorry for that. Um, Just inform me when to switch to the next slide. Yes, you're yes, presenting. I don't. Thank you. Thank you very much. My uh, presentation is about editors. Uh, who contributed to the development of Serbian periodicals and Serbian bibliography during the 19th century. And first slide is uh, actually second, next one. Uh, thank you. And uh, however, I must point it out uh, that Serbian periodicals began their development in the 18th century, primarily thanks to Zahario Felin, who started the first South Slavic journal, slaveno serbski magazine. Unfortunately, after a few more sporadic attempts to revive Serbian periodicals, there is a pause. Serbian periodicals experienced development in the 19th century since the appropriate conditions were created. When the social, historical and political circumstances became better, it was possible for Serbian literature and culture to branch out. The 19th century was the period in which Serbs abandoned an old cultural pattern. The Serbian intelligentsia was stronger at that time. The first uh, bookstore and national library were opened and the constitution was adopted. These developments laid the foundation for further progress and the creation of favorable conditions for growth. That's when Serbs finally get publications in their own language. Although among serial publications we distinguish newspapers, journals, magazines, almanacs, etc. Here we will be talk about one newspaper and one almanac that paved the way for the further development of periodicals and about several journals. 
Together, they are witnesses of an era and based of them, the cultural and historical life of the 19th century can be reconstructed. At that time, the recording of data on newly published books became more frequent and the bibliography was developed on the pages of serial publications. Many editors of publications in the 19th century, although they informed the public about the new, newly published books, did not intend to be exclusively bibliographers. But in the serial publications they edited, they set high criteria for the evaluation of bibliographic work. Therefore, especially from the bibliographic aspect, it might not be too much if we characterized the entire 19th century in Serbian culture as the epoch of Dmitri Davidovich, Georgie Magarashevich, Miloš Popovich and Stoja Novakovich, from whose works their followers later learned, referred to, supplemented and quoted. It is about them as editors and bibliographers that will be discussed and not in order of importance, because each of them has an exceptional place in Serbian cultural history, but chronologically, according to the time of publication. In the very beginning of the 19th century, Serbs needed periodicals in order to preserve their identity, to inform and con content to scattered people. Please, next slide. Thank you. At that time, in the first half of the 19th century, Dmitri Davidovich played a significant role in the development of Serbian journalism and literature. He was a prominent Serbian writer, journalist and editor. In 1813, he started together with Dmitri Frušić, Novine Srpske, which was one of the first Serbian literary and political daily newspaper. And next, please. The first full name was the newspaper from the imperial city of Vienna, but later it was given a shorter name by which it is still known. The newspaper was published in Vienna with the help of two great philologists, Jernik Kopiter and Vukaradžić, both responsible for the study and promotion of South Slavic languages. It has become an important platform for the promotion of cultural, social and political ideas in Serbia. The newspaper covers a wide range of topics, including local and international news. It featured literary works, essays and commentaries on various topics, contributing to the cultural and intellectual development of the Serbian people. The newspaper was a valuable resource to access news, cultural content and information in our native language. In the beginning, it mainly contained news taken from other newspapers, mainly from Berlin newspaper, and the news which were related to European events and Napoleonic Wars. The columns were titled according to the countries where the news came from, from Sweden, France, England, but not always in that order. Although in the first number there was only one modest article that was related to Serbia, it opened the way for further information, which will gradually come as the strictnesses of the censors decreases. A feature of the newspaper is the Smesica column, which can be translated as a column that brings new focus, uh, news focused on a certain area. In the field of literature, Davidovic regularly informed about new books while describing he respected the language and script of the publication. This type of column will appear later in other serial publications of the 19th century. With the closing of the new, this newspaper in 1822, the first, we can say, Viennese chapter of the history of Serbian press ended. Again, under his management, but in Serbia, it will be published uh, again once a week. And please, the next one. Also, as an editor, Davidovic was remembered for the first almanac called Zabavnik. Its morally instructive character is achieved mainly through selected short stories, historical texts and legends from medieval literature. And the next, please. The work of Dmitri Davidovich influenced Georgie Magarashevich. Their meeting in Vienna largely determined the further work of Georgie Magarashevich. He was Serbian historian, writer, professor and literary critic. 
In the history of Serbian literature and culture, Georgia Magarashevich is primarily significant as the initiator and editor of Letopis Srpski, later known as Letopis Matice Srpske. Because it will become a formal publication of Matica Srpska, the oldest Serbian literary, cultural, and scientific institution. And today it is one of the most prestigious Serbian journals. And the next slide, please. The journal had several interruptions. It was not published in 1835 and 1836 because the work of Matica Srpska was banned. In 1849, he also did not go out because of the revolution in Austria and during the First and Second World War. After the war, it was restored in 1946 and has been published continuously since then, and it belongs to literary journals that have one of the longest continuity not only in Serbia, but also in Europe. From the very beginning, Magarashevich as an editor encountered many obstacles primarily caused by problems related to the use of the spoken language and spelling. Magarashevich intended to print four volumes per year. However, the famous printer at that time considered anything over three volumes to be too risky, as there was still an insufficient number of interested readers. He also had serious critics of his work. The objections went so far that some felt that his job should not uh, should only be to arrange the articles and not to correct or evaluate them. Despite numerous difficulties, Magarashevich did not give up as an editor. He thought that the important of, importance of the journal was so obvious that it was unnecessary to explain it in more detail. So promoting the journal and calling for a subscription he only pointed out that publication is significant and useful for all Serbian and Slavic people. So the journal, already from the first issue, attracted considerable attention not only among readers, but also among people who were ready to financially support its publication. The first number for 1825 was pub published in 1824 after the approval of censor. In the beginning, it looked a lot like the mentioned Davidovich Almanac. Letopis means the yearbook, and later it grew into a journal. In the beginning, an orthodox calend uh, calendar with the names of the saints was uh, printed. After that, followed the part related to Europe, the list of European rulers, and basic stat statistical data related to their countries. Bibliographies of famous Serbs, as well as texts written in the spirit of the um, Enlightenment movement, were a special feature. From second number for 1825th year, it has a parallel title in German, Zerdische Jarbuch. However, the number of readers was modest. So the editor realized that the establishment of an institution was necessary, not only for the life of the journal, but for the entire Serbian culture. And this is how the literary, scientific and cultural society Matica Srpska was founded and the journal soon adopted its name. Matica Srpska has been the official publisher since 1826. Unfortunately, this greatly affected the editor's role in overseeing uh, the publication and decision making process. Since 1827, Magarashevic's role as an editor has been decreasing and he has had less and less influence on the texts that were published. From a popular journal founded for the benefit of the people, it has increasingly become a narrowly scientific one. Primarily thanks to the bibliographic articles, the journal still resembled the one edited by Magarashevich from the beginning. As a bibliographer in Letopis, Magarashevich was usually involved in compiling lists of publications, documenting authors and their work, and giving critical assessments of Serbian literary creativity. His work as bibliographer and editor contributed to the preservation of the literary history of Serbia and made it more accessible to researchers and readers interested in Serbian literature and its historical development. And the next one, please. Editors of Serbian publication in the 19th century were uh, associated, in for, if not during life, then later taking over the editing. 
The newspaper first mentioned Novine Srpske was edited by Miloš Popović between 1844 and 1855, and then again from 1857 to 1859. Miloš Popović was a journalist, writer, poet and translator. He translated Dušan's code from 14th century, the most important law of medieval Serbia. Popović had rich editorial experience editing several publications. He was remembered for his original contribution, starting and editing the journal as supplement to the newspaper called Podunavka, which was published once a week every Saturday in the period from 1843 to 1848. Mostly poems were published, but there were also texts from the field of health intending to inform and, uh, and enlighten people. The news about recently published monographic and periodical publications held a special place. This is why we recognize the contribution to the development of Serbian current bibliography. Sometimes bibliographies were created as attributes to prominent writers. Special bibliographic value are notes that are so extensive that they resembled literary criticism. Within the context of his notes, he sometimes made critical comments about readers. Therefore, the development of annotated bibliographies began with this journal. His bibliographic work is very comp comprehensive and equally important as his editorial work, which his contemporaries regarded as the work of an extremely skilled editor. And finally, uh, I have to acknowledge my favorite bibliographer and editor, uh, although it is certainly ungrateful to compare them because um, they created and work in different periods and under different conditions. It is Toy Novakovic and next slide, please. An extremely important person for Serbian culture, history, education, legislation, politics. Stoj Novaković was a Serbian politician, diplomat, philologist, historian of literature, president of Serbian Academy, director of the National Library and of the Museum, bibliographer, author of the Serbian Bibliography for Modern Literature. And one of his notable contributions was his involvement with the literary and cultural journal Vila. Next slide, please. It's about that journal. This journal aimed to promote literature, art and culture in Serbia and played a significant role in shaping the literary and intellectual landscape of its time. The journal's profile is reflected in its subtitle, Journal for Entertainment, Literature and Science. It was published from 1865 to 1868. 52 issues were published in the first three years and 36 in the last year. In the first issue, the editor addresses the readers by saying that he is aware that nowadays it is necessary to read as much as possible, that uh, he will try to have specially selected works of valuable content so that none of the readers would regret having bought it. He had different editorial approach because he especially drew attention to the importance and need for women to read, which is why it differs to a large extent from its predecessors. The journal contained poetry and literary text, but it also featured cultural news, including a theater column that covered the performance held. In this journal, Novakovic established the fundamental bibliographic principle not only for his own work, but also for further bibliographic endeavors. Bibliography is equally interested in the worst and the best printed materials. Its task is to collect everything that has been produced as comprehensively as possible. And the better it accomplishes this, the more valuable it becomes. This is briefly about the most important personalities in Serbian serial publications from the 19th century. But if the paper uh, is published, there will be more specific about each of them. But this can be uh, concluded briefly at the next slide, please. All mentioned editors and journals played a significant role in the intellectual and cultural development of Serbia during the 19th century. Their work as bibliographers had a lasting impact on the development of Serbian literature and broader cultural work and fostering cultural development. 
they show the interesting publications published abroad by Serbian authors, transla translations into Serbian and concerning Serbs. Bibliographic news was not only information, but also a recommendation and, in uh, and uh, inviting to buy books. Also, editing did not only aim to provide information, but presented a patriotic and national commitment. At that time, the Serbian people lived scattered, so it was important to have publications that would connect them. The editors were bearers of driving ideas that contributed to the shaping of Serbian literary language, the creation of national literature, the creation and development of the bibliography. With their editorial policy, they contributed to the realization of the journal's missions to promote Serbian literature, culture and science. And the next slide, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, thank you. Thank and you for now, assistance. Uh, no uh, uh, questions, please. Is there any? Would anybody like to ask something? Well, um, uh, sorry, may uh, I ask uh, our colleague um, uh, from Estonia, because I received a comment from a program committee member that this would be compared with other countries, as in Estonia, two bibliographies were first published uh, in literary journals. So if you can direct me where I could find some more information about that. Um, well, there is certainly something written about it in Estonian, but um, that would not be. <laughs> yes, maybe in English. <laughs> or... choice. So uh, um, something must be found in English, but um, that uh, needs a little search. So um, um, I'll be free to contact. Yes, we we can look for the for the references of the okay. publications that deal with uh, uh, this um, uh, question and and then send it to you. Okay, thank you. It will be really interesting for me to read and to know something yes. more about that. Thank you. Thank you yes. very much. Yes, but um, um, I would like to ask uh, if these uh, journals. Um, were they for the mass reader or more for the educated readers? Well, uh, read them? unfortunately, uh, there were a little uh, educated people. Yes. They want to promote and to learn uh, more people to read. But there was a really problem because uh, with autography and uh, language. Spoken language wasn't in paper. So it was different and that's the reason why there was uh, so uh, low um, intelligentsia. It was really a small uh, circle of um, educated people. Yes. And that's the reason why this institution, uh, Matica Srpska, was founded to uh, promote uh, reading and Serbian culture. Yes, OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, some more questions. It seems that there are um, none um, right at the moment, but okay. as it is said, we can carry on later. Okay, so I'll thank you. Thank you okay. very much. And now, uh, um, uh, Greta Kevelaitiene. Yes, from Panevesi's uh, County Public Library, uh, and her research also is concentrated on Panevesi's uh, region. And today she'll speak about the Shafirograph periodical literature there. So, please. Thank you so much. Uh, hello to everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm very glad that I'm here. Um, so, I will try to share my slides if anyone can confirm that they're okay and they're changing yes yes thank you so Everything. much cool. 
so um, once again, hello to everyone. Um, so my presentation and my research for this conference was um, Shapiro graft periodical literature in Panevisis region. And I will discuss uh, those newspapers in Panevisis region uh, which were reproduced using a Shapiro graph machine. Some of them um, are stored in the collection of uh, my county library um, and the others are in the collections of other Lithuanian memory institutions. Um, uh, almost all of them, uh, all the newspapers that I'm going to talk about is in Lithuanian language. Um, but to begin with, I would like to briefly introduce uh, what a Shapiro graph is. Uh, so around uh, 1880, um, an improved, more convenient hectograph, a Shapiro graph was developed in Germany and named after the engineer who designed it. Uh, the Shapiro graph consisted uh, of a wooden box about 50 centimeters long, 35, 35 wide and 9 high uh, with a lid and the drawer uh, for a, a roller, ink and a quill. Inside of that box, um, instead of the layers of gelatin, uh, was a roll of paper rolled on two cylinders and impregnated with a special liquid made of gelatin, glue, glycerin and other chemicals. Um, when reproducing documents, um, there was no need to immediately wipe off the used ink layer and clean the copying surface, uh, was obtained simply by turning the paper roll. Uh, the Shapiro graph was uh, much faster and easier to use. The pages of the newspaper published uh, by the people of Vilnius Belarusian Gymnasium states that we don't have a Shapiro graph yet. So the first issue was very badly printed, but to buy um, that machine we need at least 50,000 marks. Where are we going to get that kind of money? <laughs> End of quote. The ink of this device is made of water, glycerin and nylon inks, and it's not resistant uh, to the effect of light. So over time, uh, text fades and becomes hard to read. Lack of funds uh, for amateur publishing led to the use of thin, low quality paper, which became acidic and really crumbled. This results in the loss of part or even all of the text. Due to the limited financial and technical possibilities of printing machines, newspapers were produced in small print runs, usually around 70 or 100 copies. Very few newspapers have survived. Um, they were produced by this machine and the method. Rare is uh, the complete set of publications and the, in the most cases only single issue are available right now. As the names of the newspapers are, it's very significant in Lithuanian language. Um, they will not be translated literally because I don't think that English have <laughs> that kind of uh, words. Uh, so I will uh, try to keep it in the original. Um, and for example, this one, um, it's called Spiga. Uh, it's a humorous newspaper and I just couldn't figure out how to, how to translate, so um, sorry for that. Um, it, it's because um, of this uh, research uh, that my language will be about a lot of newspapers and in the screen you will be seeing uh, a less more, <laughs> a, a, a less uh, uh, examples and uh, just so you know. So um, the research revealed that uh, such periodicals were usually not even recorded in uh, bibliographs. Uh, there's a lot of valuable materials about these publications in early independence press and in the memoirs, local history publications about various places, towns and schools. Uh, when we try to compare uh, the newspapers published, we can see that there was mostly published uh, by the school children who had formed organizations or groups. Uh, some newspapers were very limited in length, only one or a few issues known. Um, in the Panevisis region, most newspapers were published in 
school communities. So, um, first of all, uh, there will um, uh, most of the of the uh, newspapers that um, I found were owned by a Catholic organization at Etininki, scouts, other organization, individual classes or groups of students. At this point, uh, there are around 50 known handwritten newspapers published in Panevejis uh, by various organization groups and people uh, duplicated by Shapirograph. The strongest newspapers from literary point of view were the ones published by students literary group Mano Kwapa in 1922. Musu Vinikas appeared in 1924. Pirmesia Dei was published, which was replaced by Stella in 1925. Uh, from 25 to 26, the students of the lower grades published Moxley Drogas, whose editor was, was Mr. Jurgutis later wrote several books. Uh, the Permoko Jinxness of 1925 was later replaced by Perkuno Vilichos and Poil Savalandos. As the activities of uh, that literary group uh, grew stronger um, after uh, 1926, much students were uh, writings were read out loud in the meetings and the group newspapers were probably not published at that time. One of the best newspapers of that literary group was Dobelosiadas. In 1935, several copies of it uh, are currently preserved in Jozas Balchkonis Gymnasium History Museum. Its name is associated with a person um, of the group's mentor, uh, Julianas Linda Dobilas. In the second issue, uh, an essay from uh, that mentor was published, an article about uh, the religiousness in Dobilas' work. Uh, the 25th anniversary of Leo Tolstoy uh, commemorates at the uh, and the work of Bronus Januszka and other writers uh, are published in that newspaper. The editorial uh, replies show that uh, later uh, a lot of uh, scholars and uh, teachers uh, published poems um, because the most pieces of, uh, of poems are in this, in this publication. And out of 11 publication, only two pieces of prose. Uh, are in there. One issue quotes uh, Leonas Linde saying, let us remember ourselves and let the youth have the foolishness. The world will not be uh, able to exist without it. So a lot of uh, things there are published in these uh, newspapers and um, the first edition of that newspaper, um, 1935, is preserved in Vrublevsky Library of the Lithuanian Academy of Sciences and the Library of the Institute of Lithuanian Liter Literature and Folklore. Um, and the very issue, um, uh, uh, an article of um, Mr. Joromskis, who studied in Panevežys Gymnasium, is published and he wrote about our famous uh, artist Cherlonis. So in 1924, students published um, another uh, paper uh, with the title Pirmie Jade. The younger students kept up with the older friends and published um, Moxley Drogas in 1924 um, till 1926. Um, in 1925, a progressive student group, uh, they uh, published a newspaper, Lysas Aidas. Although it was a very small format, it was a relatively strong newspaper, um, but in the same year, in 1925, there was, uh, he was replaced um, in, by another one uh, called Parkuna Vilichos. Um, so uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, young uh, children in schools, um, even a group of nationalist school children published Totoskelo. Um, another group of people, uh, we called it Oshrininke in 1918. Uh, there was a 60 members in Panevežys of that group um, uh, and the most uh, active ones um, uh, published a uh, 
letter in the newspaper, Lysves Kailas. Um, the, it's also was duplicated by the Shapiro graph. Uh, it is difficult to say when it was launched, uh, as only the third issue published in 1920 is known. Um, in the newspaper with the large format, um, 21, uh, around 21 and 36 centimeters, um, and it, it was sold for four golden coins. Uh, so another uh, newspaper, uh, we call it Incarelis, uh, published by Ateitininke of Birgi. Uh, the first known issue of that newspaper was published in 1918, but the contest suggests that it wasn't the first issue. Um, uh, this one, this, uh, this newspaper was published in Birgi even before World War I um, and later relaunched. So we know uh, it relaunched in 1922-23rd uh, school year. Uh, it was published with pictures, poems, review articles, usually signed by um, nicknames of Jibute, Osteya, um, in the 1924 uh, and 25 issue, the editorial board asked to send more of, of people's work and to sign the real names. Um, and we know that our famous writer uh, Bernardas Brajones, who studied in the Birgi, Birgi uh, Gymnasium, uh, wrote to that uh, newspaper and some of the poems written down to, to Shapiro graphed uh, newspapers by himself. There is an author's signature under a poem, Jalesis Asotis, in 1926. Um, a large group of scouts uh, was in Panevijis region. Uh, there are uh, even a handful of uh, scout newspapers uh, that uh, appeared by Shapiro Graf. Um, even 24 to 32 pages of, of newspapers were, were published. Um, there was an upper grade students and, and, and other ones. Um, um, they published a newspaper Overis, uh, Lapinus, and the Scout uh, itself um, in first half of uh, 20, 1926. And there's a lot of uh, humorous newspapers that we can found and uh, right now in the uh, History Museum of Joasas uh, Balchkonis Gymnasium, they have a humorous newspapers Puspadis Gymnasisto Bato, uh, preserved by the former student and later a teacher uh, and presented by the teachers uh, to the school. All of them were printed by a Shapiro graph, 16 pages long, and it was sold for 10 cents each. The older uh, known humorist publication was Contaplis, published in 1925. So, uh, but unfortunately, with the beginning of the Soviet occupation, this type of newspapers were no longer published. Um, a huge part of uh, Shapiro graphed um, newspapers were the ones who were illegal and uh, the Communist Party and young communists were the main publishers of illegal uh, newspapers. In 1927, there was 29 branches of the Young Communist Party in Panevijis with 122 members. and. Um, Probably the first illegal publication appeared in 1927. It was Shapiro graphed by participants of the revolutionary movement. The organizer of Panevji district, district Committee um, named Four. It was dedicated for the four communists and it was prepared and published by Panevji's residents. It was a small format, 20 pages newspaper with a print run of perhaps about 20 copies. It is not clear exactly how many issues saw the light of the day. Perhaps it was one time publication. Uh, the newspaper was approved by Central Committee of Communist Party of Lithuania and uh, they uh, said that uh, they need to improve the technical aspects of the magazine was pointed out that it's recommended that such as similar publications were published in the other region, also in Lithuanian language. 
at a meeting of the Young Communists uh, Panevsky's Committee at the end of the August in 1928, it was decided to publish an illegal newspaper, newspaper of their own in order to maintain contact with the district communist organizations uh, and to serve as a tool for a direct communication with non-union youth. The Young Communist Initiatives was supported uh, by a representative of the Communist Party of Lithuania, um, who was active in Panevžys at that time. In 1928, the newspaper Komil appeared. It was a four-page newspaper with a large format um, and probably the strongest contact in Panevžys underground press. Um, its editor was Mr. Jurginis, who came to the men's gymnasium from Ukmerge in the spring of uh, 1928 and was already very well familiar with the publication of the Ukmerge illegal newspaper. So Mr. Jurginis himself writes in his own memoirs, um, quote, our activities in the gymnasium were growing. In 1928, we started publishing the newspaper Communalis. We wanted the newspaper to be not only informative, but also a beautiful, nicely printed. We bought a Shapirograph and Mr. Boukis, who worked as a clerk for the county agronomist, took care of the typing of the entire newspaper. It was copied in print run of 100 copies in the flat of underground worker. The press came out very clean. End of the quote, recalls Mr. Jurgins, and was not ashamed to distribute in the gymnasium to those who were sympathetic to the cause or to leave it in the desks where the morning shift uh, would find it because uh, students were working in the evening shifts. Uh, it was known that three issues of this new paper was published. The collaborators, of course, signed it under the nicknames. Um, on uh, behalf of Paranagis District Committee of the Communist Party of Lithuania, Mr. Jurginis and Mr. Shumauskas published um, one illegal uh, publication uh, called Permoi Gegužė, a 30 copy edition. It contains articles uh, on the International Working People's Day. Uh, after the departure of underground activists, Mr. Jurginis and Mr. Shumauskas from Panevijis, the publication of illegal literature was temporarily suspended. In 1929 till 1931, the Young Communist Periodical Press was no longer published in this region. Only a few years later, uh, around May in 1932, uh, the Young Communist uh, published um, um, a uh, newspaper called Pashvaste. The newspaper appeared uh, in, the, in their Young Communist leader, uh, Mr. Grigas initiative, handwritten, uh, multiplied with a Shapirograph. It was uh, distributed among young uh, youth of Panevijis and its surroundings. It encouraged the youth to form communist groups to fight against the violence of the Soviet Union and to support the socialist movement of their work. The 25-page publication contained information from Panevijis businesses, although it was advertised as a monthly newspaper, only one issue is known. Um, thanks for the effort of the members of the committee uh, of the Communist Party of Lithuania in Rokiškis sub-area, um, 1931, the illegal newspaper of, of uh, Communist Party Darbininku Mintis was published. It addressed the question of the practical work and contained a number of articles to raise an ideology. Um, the ter te theoretical level, it uh, included an expert from Marx and Engels Communist Party of Manifesto and articles on anti-religious themes. Um, uh, five issues were published uh, in uh, Vilunishki village. The newspaper had a print run about 200 copies. Uh, the printed newspaper was transported by the members of uh, sub-area to Rokiškis by the foot, later by the bicycle at night. 
It began to fall into the hands of many young workers and school children. As the newspaper spread, it also came to the attention of the intelligence services, which began to search for its publishers. Finally, one of them was arrested, but the newspaper continued to be published. The, first, the fifth issue of this newspaper uh, were published and most popular and re relatively uh, long running newspaper at that time was a, a significant step into the activities of the Communist Party. Um, so in uh, Rokishkis and not only in that area, the Communist Party um, newspaper was an example for the communist youth and other districts there at the time the press was weaker or not allowed it at all um, it's worth mentioning that um, in 1928 uh, illegal newspaper kova by the union was also printed by the shapiro graph it was a newspaper which published material from the life of the companies in Panevigis about the trade union activities, the affairs, the unemployment issues. It was edited by the Communist Party for the relations between group in Panevigis, Anikshi, Kupishkis, Rokishkis and Zarasei. Um, and in 1928, it started publishing an illegal two-page newspaper, Jariya. It, uh, it's believed that uh, three or four issues were published, not all of them have survived. The material uh, received uh, from the newspaper was typed by Mr. Bukis and reproduced by Mr. Yurginis using a notary office Shapiro graph. The um, publication of the newspaper was interrupted by the arrest of Mr. Bukis in 1929 and he was sentenced four years in prison. Um, after the beginning of political organizations um, in gymnasiums, their newspapers were no longer published. And our, in our region, we have a famous writer, Yuasas Keluatas. He remembers that his classmate um, and future linguist, uh, Mr. Skarjus, who uh, was his future teacher, published a newspaper called Naile. Uh, I can translate that one, it's love. And for uh, a writer, Gabriela Petkevchaita Bitte, uh, it was the closest to her heart because love was the principle of her own society activities and teaching principle. So thank you so much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the pictures because um, they're all from my uh, uh, research and my uh, library um, so they're quite uh, hard to read into them because they're very blank but we have them and we would love to share them with you thank you thank you thanks a lot and uh, now um, are there any questions about these um, interesting newspapers Uh, well, can I? Yes, yes, please. Uh, I saw very interesting drawings in these, uh, 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 well, printed in Shapiro Graph newspapers. Probably they were also initiated by the editors or uh, is something known about that? Not at all. Uh, we only uh, we can read into them uh, just as they are presented. Uh, there's nothing more about them written in those newspapers. It's just like illustration. Um, but uh, there's also like a common common views to see the flowers or to some sort of nature, um, birds, uh, sunsets, and and all of that. Um, uh, themed uh, pictures, but nothing about them. It's written in the newspapers. Uh, thank you. Uh, I do know uh, about such publications in Estonia by the, um, um, let's say, grammar school children, or uh, but nothing uh, uh, about that. Either Estonian communists had their secret papers. <laughs> that is. Uh, 
Uh, that I do not know. Uh, that was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Estonian communists, I th think they had uh, secret newspapers, but not uh, not um, uh, printed uh, uh, on the Shafirograph. But uh, these uh, Shafirographs must have been very widespread in, in Panevesi's region, as I see. And did everyone buy their own uh, Shafirograph? Were they very cheap? Oh, no, no. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, one uh, group of uh, in Vilnius, uh, they wanted to buy that uh, that Shapiro graph, but they uh, they are writing in their memoirs that it costs 50,000 marks. And where are we going to get that kind of money? Um, in Panevijis region, we can see that uh, they were sharing. Um, they're using uh, notaries' uh, offices that they used one of them. I actually couldn't find the picture of that machine because I hope there is one, uh, but I didn't get to find um, by this research. So I hope to maybe even um, someone has it in the museums or 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 such. But uh, there was a, if you have a Shapiro graph, you're very, very well known uh, publisher or, or you have a lot of uh, quality in, in your newspapers. So it was hard to find one in, in this region. OK, yes, yes, because I thought that uh, um, there were so many publishers of these, uh, these um, uh, newspapers uh, uh, that where were the Shapiro graphs? Yes. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you. So, any other questions? Well, no. But um, uh, thank you, and and um, uh, it is now time for lunch break. So, thank you for all the participants of the first sessions. Uh, thanks to all. Uh, uh, presenters to to listeners and um, we can now uh, uh, move to the lunch break and then uh, 12 50, 50 uh, the sessions will uh, continue